uh, three. He's deputy director for the U.S. State's Department of Agriculture. And I will state as you're coming up that uh, you have not been cleared to provide testimony the committee, but we participate uh, your ability to answer some questions. I'm sure that we get a broader general. Yeah, just maybe some broader general big, big, uh, picture questions. Maybe just, I think I asked the last panel uh, earlier about the U.S., Canada, Mexico. Uh, did they have held out populations in those countries? Uh, Mexico and Canada do not. Uh, New Zealand and Australia uh, is believed to uh, originate uh, in, in Australia. But both Australia and New Zealand do have uh, established populations of black people. They do. And do they, do they have, have they reached any different scientific conclusions than we have? through our particular EIR and, and the, uh, I, I, I have not read, to be honest with you, I have not read the EIR, um, mm -hmm. so I can't really uh, say one way or the other uh, on that, but um, I can speak to the trade uh, component Please. of that whole, yes. uh, uh, the gentleman previously uh, mentioned a legitimate uh, a point. Um, I, I think, though, it's important to remember that in the case, uh, the specific case that was mentioned, and that was the apples from New Zealand, um, uh, in the case of the U.S., there is a mandatory IPM program specific to like brown apple moth that's required and a very, very intensive inspection regime. Um, if you take um, the, the other part of this component, Chairman, that I think is important to keep in mind is that the international arena is becoming smaller and smaller. And by that, what I mean is um, we export uh, a lot of produce to Mexico and Canada, two biggest trading partners for California. Um, for New Zealand to ship to those countries, the LBAM hosts either have to be treated or come from free areas. I can see a situation where uh, under different circumstances in California, I could see uh, those two trading partners in particular uh, requiring uh, the same import conditions. And under discrimination within the IPPC, they have to uh, create a, a equivalent import conditions. So I could see that as a, as a potential um, side effect. And if we were to uh, declassify uh, our particular LNAM issue from a Class A threat to something minor non-actionable test, would that cause other countries to follow suit from your, in your opinion? Um, yeah, I've heard that. Um, I guess my feeling is this. Um, the trade arena internationally has, has become a lot more sophisticated. And I think that by and large, uh, through training, sometimes by the U.S. themselves, other developed uh, countries like Japan and Australia, um, the plant protection authorities of, of most of our trading partners become pretty sophisticated. And I think that, by and large, anybody that thinks that if the U.S. was to deregulate, that necessarily some of the other trading partners would sort of fall in line. I, I don't see that. Uh, I see examples, uh, historically, uh, that have just happened recently, uh, that indicate that that would not be the case. And in terms of the, uh the international trade issue is so shaded for the dimension by some of our farmers in the last panel. Um, it, are there state to state distinctions in the way that we do things for California? Um, I can't I'm, say not sure. I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, I mean, we have a, we have a state control issue through CDFA here mm -hmm. on Hellbound. Is there any difference in what we do in other states, let's say Florida, for example? Um, I want to make sure I understand the question. Is, is Florida, it, it, what would happen if we deregulate? What would happen in the case of interstate movement? Right. Well, I, I, I would uh, think that, uh, well, two things could happen. Um, the states could petition us, the U.S. Uh, government, to impose restrictions. Uh, if if that none of that happened, then I could see a scenario where trading partners would consider not only California generally infested, but probably the United States generally infested. And so they would impose requirements likely for like by apple moth hosts from those states. And then if we negotiate, is held down one of those items we negotiate about, or is it something that's a hard, fast issue with other countries? Is it something to negotiate with? Or 
just kind of one of those things that's off the table? It re no, it, it really, in fact, we've uh, spent quite a bit of time on, I would say, rather substantive negotiations with, uh, particularly with Canada and Mexico, a little bit with Chile and some of the other uh, trading partners. There's uh, roughly about 11 that have it listed as a quarantine pass, some of them fairly major, um, but certainly, um, Canada and Mexico rise to the top, and we've had, I would say, rather substantive negotiations in trying to, uh, the, the knee-jerk reaction sometimes by trading partners to just prohibit, but we were able to at least uh, keep product moving under specified conditions. Thanks, all the questions I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Okay, let's have a panel four from CDFA, John Hewitt, and uh, Dr. Robert Levitt. Both for joining us. I don't have statements. I have some questions. I don't know how you want to, how you want to start. I guess you know what I'm really more interested in, as I said at the beginning of the hearing, is maybe just getting a quick outline on the history of the EAR. It would be good to get on the record. And uh, you know, kind of what triggered the EIR and uh, was it necessary to add value and ultimately who wrote it and you know, those types of big picture questions. Certainly, Senator, and uh, good afternoon. John Hewitt, General Counsel with the Department of Food and Agriculture, and accompanying me is Dr. Robert Levitt, Acting Director of Plant Health and Pest Prevention Division. Um, I'd like to thank, thank, the, thank the Senator, the committee, and also the other guests for their continued interest in invasive species. Quite a bit of information. I know you have quite a bit of questions, so I'll jump right to the timeliest information um, for the committee. After nearly two years of work, CDFA is certified as public. Um, it's Light Brown Apple Moth Programmatic Environmental Impact Report. The broad purposes and objectives of the Environmental Impact Report are protecting California agriculture and the environment from damage by the Light Brown Apple Moth and the use of tools to accomplish this in an environmentally safe and responsible manner. I'd also like to highlight a couple of minor program revisions and clarifications that are contained in the programmatic environmental impact report. In summary, the Light Brown Apple Moth program will focus its resources on control and suppression where possible, and it will eradicate small outlying and discrete infestations. Initially, this will occur through the deployment of twist ties and supplemented or superseded in the near future by the sterile insect technology as soon as it is practical. And CDFA will not be making any aerial releases of insect pheromone as a management strategy for the Light Brown Apple Moth program. Is the, uh, the ladder item, is that spraying? The ladder, the ladder item, the, ladder the, the, the eradication tool yeah. for... Um, you just mentioned. Correct, that, I think that more commonly referred to as the aerial spraying, yeah. aerial application of pheromones is, has been re removed as a management tool for the light brown apple, apple moth program, that is correct. Okay, and is that firm, solid, not to go back to policy? Correct, that is firm, solid. Uh, it is discussed in the findings that are accompanying the, uh, the environmental impact report. Okay. Correct, Senator. Okay. And is that to say that we were too quick on the draw to start that process? Governor moving through, I believe, the executive order to do that? Um, I think it wasn't good. Now, was it good then? I'm just trying to get an understanding how we make these decisions. Cer certainly, Senator. I guess I'm, I'm having because a little bit EIR, difficulty following you. I apologize. If well, the EIR probably tells you we're not going to do any spray, correct? Um, actually, the Environmental Impact Report evaluated um, the aerial application of pheromones as a management tool as well as a number of other management tools. It was concluded through that process that it is not going to be the most efficacious uh, tool for the current strategies that we wish to wish to deploy. Okay, and but we but we did deploy it at the beginning of this process. Is that correct? Correct. The Department of Food and Agriculture did did utilize aerial application of pheromones in a couple of instances back in 2007. However, if I could clarify, Senator, 
the goals of the program were substantially different at that time, as well as our legislative mandate was different as well. What were the goals of the program then as opposed to now? The goal of the pro program at that then, point, yeah. in 2007, um, as Food and Ag Code Section 6050.1, excuse me, recently repealed Food and Ag Code Section 6050.1 required us to eradicate the light brown apple moth. However, as is discussed in the Environmental Impact Report, there have been a number of changes, including the development of sterile insect technology, as well as an exponential increase of the apple moth population, which have contributed to the decision not to use it as a management tool. Is there a change, not only in that section you mentioned, but in philosophy at the department? Are we now saying that we are not going to eradicate under the EIR, is this still full eradication or is this some sort of management tool? Um, I, I, if, if I'm not the response is just jump right in, but I think I understand what you're getting at. The, the goals and objectives of the program now are to control and suppress the light brown apple moth program and in those outlying areas would be to eradicate those small and discrete populations of the apple moth. And what percentage of uh, the small and discrete populations are we trying to eradicate and which percentage are we leaving alone or just managing that pie? And the outer areas are little pieces uh -huh. we're trying to eradicate. What, what percentage of the program is kind of geared towards I'm personally, that? I'm personally not sure about the percentage of numbers, but I'll refer to Dr. Levitt yeah, we, we, as the acting director. And Dr. Levitt could talk a little bit about um, successes of eradication in those outlying areas where we've successfully taken those discrete populations and already eradicated them, and then also the plans going forward. In, okay, in, let's in do that. Right. I want to keep, I'll bounce it out between you both. But Certainly. have we, big picture question, have we ever eradicated any pests in California? Uh, that I mean, makes, absolutely 100%. Yeah, if I may, Senator, the uh, first question about the, the percentages. Uh, most of the light brown apple moth are in what we call the generally infested area, and that would be in roughly Marin down to Santa Cruz, including the, um, the western sides of Alameda County and Contra Costa County. And uh, in that area, we are adapting a contain and suppress strategy. We are doing, planning on doing local eradication and the small localized outlier populations. And right now, those would include areas in which we have one or two moths more than five miles away from the generally infested area. In particular, we're looking at uh, Davis, uh, Tracy, Antica, Los Osos, Royal Grande, a few places like that. And I believe we're doing delimitation right now in San Diego and we're awaiting also uh, results from Stockton and Woodland. So they're very small outlying up, but the, the, the goal of that is to keep agricultural produce and products from the Central Valley moving to foreign and domestic markets. And we have eradicated previous small outlier infestations with the pheromone twist ties, and in one case with BT, in Napa, at Treasure Island, um, Sherman Oaks, um, um, San Jose, I think there was a couple other locations. So we do know that to know that there are trust that technology works. Okay. Um, so what what is the difference in the program from 2007 to now as you've given those, given that area, given what you call the outlier areas where we have eradication, given the permanent and through there we now call contain and suppress. What is the difference in this policy as opposed to what it has been in the past years. Are you specifically asking about the difference between a, an eradication program and a con con well, contain and control? You did an EIR. What's, what did you learn from the EIR that's changed your approach, in your opinion, of this particular problem, this light brown apple moth issue? What's changed since the EIR that you know that you didn't do or apply? In years past. Well, I'll speak broadly and then defer to Dr. Levitt, but the difference between eradication and control and suppression program isn't necessarily in the tools that are used, but in the frequency and the density in which they are used. That's, that's, the, that's the general difference between the control 
and an eradication program. Dr. Levitt? Uh, thank you, uh, John. Yes, uh, Senator, again, I want to stress that the goal of the uh, Life Run Ethanol program is to keep California agricultural produce moving into foreign and domestic markets, and that's always been the overarching goal from the beginning. Now, I also want to clarify that in the environmental impact report, uh, several alternatives were uh, evaluated as being available to the program. I'd like to stress that all of those alternatives were found to be adequately environmentally safe. Environmentally safe. That is the five alternatives that were in the final draft. But what has happened, and I'd also like to stress that the aerial release alternative in the EIR was different than, the, than what was actually done in 2007. That said, yes, the program has changed direction, and that's based upon the survey and tracking data. Uh, on March 15th, the USDA made an announcement that based upon the extent in, in, of the infestation of light run apple moth here in California, that in their judgment, eradication is no longer feasible. And the CDFA, of course, has the same data, and we concur with that conclusion. Was that conclusion di different than what you started with? In 2007? In 2007, the USDA convened a technical working group of world-class experts uh, on the light run apple moth, and given the trapping and infestation data at that time, uh, the USDA and the CDFA believed that the infestation could be eradicated. Okay, and, and what is the opinion now of CDFA? So has the population increased since that time, or has it actually gotten smaller? Or did I get control, or what's the big picture in terms of the population? And the big picture, Senator, is that the, the population of the light brown ap apple moth has increased in the generally infested areas exponentially. Um, <coughs> the numbers are contained in the environmental impact report, but from the non-scientist perspective, I can tell you that in those heavily infested urban areas, the, the, the densities are, are growing rapidly. And, and how do these populations move? Um, uh, Senator, the populations can move two ways, uh, essentially. One is through natural spread, and uh, we believe that to be actually quite slow. The main way that the populations of any invasive species would spread, including the light on apple moth, is through artificial human assisted movement, and particularly on, uh, you know, a nursery stock, plants given to your grandmother, uh, in some way being carried from one location to another by people. So. Uh, they're being moved by people like us. Well, I mean, they're, uh, if, you know, everybody doesn't go to the, the store or look in their, their backyard for invasive pests necessarily when they, you know, give a plant to their daughter or something. So it, it does move by inadvertent like that. Do these uh, predators have any natural, does the Galbound moth have any natural predators? And, and, and would we have enough of these natural predators to actually inhibit the spread or is this something that we're not? Yes, Senator, the, 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 the CDFA actually started a program to track natural uh, enemies, natural uh, predators from the very beginning back in 2007. And we know that uh, they are at least semi-effective in other, other countries, New Zealand and Australia. What our researchers say so far is that the number of natural predators here in California are few and that the effect so far is minimal. But we do track that because uh, it would be uh, an important part of decreasing the population. Okay, and, and just so I'm clear on what the department's position is at this point, we've been bannering a little bit eradication versus control. You've given me some examples of Santa Maria, excuse me, uh, Santa Cruz and Marin as a control and suppressed area, some of the smaller outlier areas as being eradication. Is that, so what's the goal? Is it both? Is it one? Is it the overall picture control and suppress? What, what would you term? As Dr. Levitt mentioned earlier, that the overarching goal is to allow agricultural products to continue to be able to move domestically as well as internationally and protect the, the existing environment, the light brown apple model. I think somebody mentioned earlier is it could feed on potentially more than 2,000 plants in California. Um, specifically to achieve that goal, as I mentioned in my opening comments, the department will focus its resources on control and suppression where possible 
and in those small and in those erratic outlying areas, the goal would be to eradicate and keep the pests from from moving. Okay, and I, and I guess keep mattering this, but you have a process that said eradicate. That's one one point at, by 2015. Is that no longer? Is that no longer the goal? That is correct. The the, um, the findings that accompanied the EIR and certification made it, made a, a moderate revision to that, and that is focusing from eradication to control and suppression. That's I've been trying to get to say that sentence for the last ten minutes. So okay, so we're clear. So we've gone from an eradication program to a control and suppress program with goals no longer set in 2015 and total eradication. Correct. That is correct. Okay. As I mentioned before, the primary reasons for that was the exponential increase in the, in the apple moth population as well as the sunsetting of food and ag code section 6050.1. Right. No, I get it. It just, it just brings to mind, in, in, for future reference, I guess, to the CDFA, from our vantage point, from my vantage point, I should say, that the rest of it isn't here, that we, in late 2007, just began to utilize an area treatment that was hell-bent on eradication and it took us an EIR to recognize that control and suppression of a population is natural in its habitat it is always going to be with us and has always been with us. It is, of course, probably not the best course of action. That's what the EIR tells me. Senator, I think um, you know, my reading of the ER would indicate that you know, over more, over the course of two plus years of preparing that environmental impact report, the one thing we couldn't do was freeze the population numbers at their current levels. So it was a bit of a moving target, I guess you could say, in that in that instance. That yeah. as we continue to work through the, the public process, process bigger, right? Yeah, absolutely. So the 2007 spring was kind of a worthless endeavor. Then, right? Well, I disagree, Senator. We were okay. looking to fulfill our statutory obligation, which was to eradicate the light brown apple moth at that time, based right. on population numbers in 2007. No, no, I get it. Um, it. It just seems to me that it, it was, and the governor took that action via executive order, is that correct? So we say, you know, to meet the statutes or to meet the charge was to eradicate, and that, I thought the governor utilized, went to part of utilized an executive order in order to call this an emergency, so that his emergency powers would allow for swift action on this, or was that not the way it proceeded, or? Um, I, to be honest with you, I, Senator, I wasn't with the department at that time in 2007, but my understanding of, of the governor's emergency powers, and I, I don't want to propose to be an expert by any means on this, is that that, that would have been the tool to achieve eradication, that actually Food and Act Code Section 6050.1 specifically laid out eradication as, as the department's direction for the program at that time. So the EIR was, from your perspective, then has changed the policy absolutely on its head in terms of your program today for Alabama, um, as opposed to where we started. Today. Yeah, Senator, um, I'm not sure that I, I, I would respectively disagree that the EIR itself changed the program. The EIR just pro uh, provided alternatives to the program which were evaluated and all were accepted uh, in the EIR. Uh, there was originally six, we went to five, all five were accepted. It's the program itself that changed, and it was a policy decision of the Department of Food and Agriculture and of, uh, I believe of the USDA that would bind their decision that it's just no longer feasible because the populations have all been right. going to USDA to came out and told us in January that the eradication was no longer uh, feasible. Correct. Yeah, by 2000. Yeah, by 2015. What was the general cost of the eradication effort? you know how much we spent on this? Year-to-date, year throughout the entire process, or? How about just the process? The process in total, Dr. Levin? Yes, thank you, John. Um, I can tell you about the state of California, what the CDFA has spent, and that is uh, through January of this year, which are the latest numbers that I have from the beginning of the program, we spent uh, approximately $39 million of federal funds 
and approximately four and a half million dollars of state funds. Okay. And the USDA spent, of course, uh, more uh, on their own behalf. Okay. And let me ask, um, you know, we're at the, at the close of my, my legislative career here in the, uh, in the legislature and, and the governors as well, um, depending on what side you're on, it could be a positive day for either. Uh, but I think the, the issue I have leading this place is how do we know the program won't change when we're gone? That we won't go back to, to spring, that we won't go back to... I mean, how do we create a pro How does the CAR get placed in some sort of, you know, stone that people refer to it as, as you, I just said, you, do we ever spray again? And I think the answer was, what was the answer actually? The answer with respect to the eradication or destroying suppression, um, the department will not be using aerial application of, of pheromones to treat the light brown apple yeah, moth. How do we, do I need to put that in statute before I leave so that all of us leave here with some sort of sense that we made? I mean, I'm just wondering because, you know, things have changed. Or does that hamper the department from your perspective for, in terms of some sort of future review of the apple moth? I mean, the EIR gave us an indication of what should be done. USDA told us its opinion. <coughs> but if we were to put a bill in and say, this will end this for good, um, based on an EIR that I think people look to and say, OK, you know, this has contained suppressed. Would, would that be something that the, that the administration or CDA they would support? Senator, I can't speak on behalf of the administration with respect to prospective legislation, sure. but if I may explain a little bit about the significance of the findings document as it relates sure. to the environmental Im impact report, because I think the short answer is no. I don't think the senator that you need to um, to, the, to carry legislation forth, because um, the findings document with respect to the environmental impact report lays out, essentially clarifies and supersedes in some respects what's in the environmental impact report. And as a policy statement, the removal of the management tool of airily, airily treating a light brown apple moth with pheromones, <coughs> that door has been shut. The, the opportunity, you said, uh, you know, if the department came back, next administration came back, they would have to undergo subsequent environmental review process to go ahead and open that door back up. So the public would be invited back in at that point, Senator, to have a discussion and debate about whether or not that's the correct choice to the correct avenue to proceed down. Okay, so basically you're talking that every type of decision in this case should have an EIR prior to the choosing of, let's say, aerial spraying or something of that sort, eradication efforts. Um, I'm not sure I follow the question, Senator, but all projects that a, that the state or CDFA undertakes are subject to the California Environmental Quality Act. Okay, but when the governor asked for spraying, did he have that in his briefcase and didn't show any of us? Because I'm not sure it was an EIR that allowed for that, just a statute. I mean, how, that's what I mean. How, why would we have done this type of study prior to this aerial spraying period? Well, the department made the decision to utilize the aerial application of pheromones as a management tool in 2007 to try and eradicate the light brown apple moth right. because the population on, was based based on, so low. But it wasn't based on the IR, correct? That is correct. We utilized two, uh, two different tools under the California Environmental Quality Act to proceed with, with our activities. What were, what, were the, what were the two tools? We used uh, an emergency exemption as well as a categorical exemption under California Environmental Quality Act. Yeah. That's a, what, how, the, how are those triggers? The governor called for a state of emergency in this? No, the, the, well, yeah. the Department of Food and Ag would make an evaluation about whether or not, first of all, the general CEQA checklist would be, is, is the proposed activity a project by definition under CEQA? Right. If it is, is it, you know, the first threshold would be, is it categorically or some, or some other way exempt from 
the CEQA review process. And most things that are exempt from CEQA review process are emergencies, correct? <coughs> I don't know the percentages, Senator, of what was it? What, I guess yeah. what was why was this an emergency? I mean today we find out now we're in a control suppress environment with you know Marin and Santa Cruz and suppression and control and small outlying areas with five moss and under an eradication type of a, uh, an issue. But that doesn't seem to sound the alarm as an emergency, although it's important trade and as you've been mentioned, you know, that's the number one thing is move agriculture through the process. But we're, we're trying to understand how we prevent, you know, a lot of our role here obviously is to to do oversight. And when we do oversight, we have to ask and we should ask questions about you know, how can we learn from this particular 2007 to 2010 experiment, um, if you will. And you're telling me that under CEQA you're allowed two, two types of exemptions that would not force the department to do a full EIR. And I'm just wondering, you know, how do we create a system that would have you look at the EIR so would, would have made this decision in 2007 versus today? My, Senator, my general thoughts are that the, that the CEQA process is extremely protective of the op public's opportunity to provide input. In the case that, in the, with the sample, with the problem is that the governor didn't utilize that process when he did the spring in 2007. I mean, that's that's the entire gist of the problem. Is it didn't allow for this type of transparent discussion to just spray and ask questions later. And then there was an outcry, and then strength stopped. And there was a bigger outcry, and then there was an EIR. And now we find the department standing before saying, oh, no, no, we're not going to eradicate. We're just going to control and suppress, which was the original call back in 2007. And the question is, how do we, you, and we're basing it on the feds who made a decision, USDA, and also our own ERR now. The question is simply, how do we prevent those types of decisions from any administration? Governor Schwarzenegger, Governor, whoever. I mean, you know, how do we, how do we allow for CDFA to, to make substantive decisions based on good science? Well, the decision that the department made with respect to the aerial application of pheromones for the light brown apple moth was based on what we believed to be the environmental and economic risk to California at that time. And, you know, as USDA has has articulated in their most recent reports that 33 states, 2,500 plant species, and in California alone, 200 to 500 million dollars of, of crops are potentially at risk annually. So I mean, those are some of the contributing factors that, it, that the department used in determining to proceed forward with, with aerial application of pheromones as a, as a management tool on set. Yeah, oh, I understand that, but I, I, I think you know, today we look back and we, you stand on the DIR that says we have other methods. Is it correct that say the department had to be sued in order to produce this DIR? It wasn't something you voluntarily did, right? Well, I, I disagree, Senator, but go ahead. Um, I believe that we started the DIR process before the lawsuit was sent there. Okay, how, how much? <coughs> uh, several months, I believe. Several months, yeah. Okay. It, it was talked about at the very beginning of the program. It took a while to do the initial study and go through the steps that uh, John Deal was just saying. Okay. Okay. Let me just go through a few more questions. Just, I'm getting a clear picture of kind of what we want to do here from a legislative point of view. I'm just trying to see if I can get a few more questions answered. Um, the, the controls that are currently in the IR that you've outlined the beginning of your, your testimony, um, then say that pesticides or aerial spraying itself uh, will, will not be utilized in any, any conditions, any under any conditions at this point? That is correct, Senator. With respect to the light brown apple moth program, our findings set and provide the clarification from our final AIR that the department will not be utilizing aerial application of pheromones as a management tool for the light brown apple moss. Okay. 
But then I guess I've read this as saying that at least in populations of areas of 100 persons or less, um, that there is spraying, aerial spraying is allowed. Is that correct? That, that correct, Senator. That statement appears in the final environmental impact report, but that statement is clarified and superseded by what is in the findings. And that is the, the department's position that they will not use aerial the aerial application of pheromones as a management tool for wet ground apple on Okay. Um, and in terms of the, the fall spring, um, there were reports of respiratory systems, symptoms, excuse me. How did we deal with that data in this particular EIR? Was that the health effects of this taken into account? Are you talking specifically about the environmental review process or about the, the complaints from citizens relative to the, the 2007, 2007 treatment? And were that testimony then taken into account in terms of some of the findings of the actual EIR itself? Dr. Levin. Uh, thank you, John. Yes, in the actual EIR itself, it had the, uh, the, the, the ultimate formulations, not the ones used in 2007, and it had the um, the maps of where we were applying. In the comments, however, in the responses to comments, which is the last part of the EIR, we did address the question you're asking about the 2007 aerial applications. And we referenced the study done by the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment and the Department of Pesticide Regulation and the process they put in place to track uh, future uh, reports of this type. And we referenced their report that's been in the public arena now for I think two years, saying there was no, they found no direct connection between the sprays and the pesticide illnesses. The um, and this certified, this EIR is now been certified, is that correct? It's as of yesterday, today? That is correct, Senator. And the, so all of the methods as put forth in the EIR now is the official policy of CDPA, what you're following then, correct? That is correct, Senator. Okay. Um, let me just ask a few more questions. Um, can people, um, do people have recourse under your current methods? In other words, people still disagree with even your implementation of the EIR. There are other means for people to feel free to deal with CDFA and yeah. Respective to the general operation of the program moving forward, yeah. or their remedies under CEQA, or what? How about the moving forward? Moving forward, the department's the department's always open to and responsive to comments that the public may have with respect to management of this program going forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's all the questions I have. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, for your interest in this speech. Thank you.